So Michelangelo is at the Beatles, Rembrandt, Michael Jackson, Beethoven, and he went on and on and on about who he thought was the greatest, not recognizing even his infrastructure to answer that question was misled and outdated. And so finally, I kindly smiled and said, okay, sir, you asked me who is the greatest of all time. Now you tried to share yours, so let me share mine because there's no debate about who is the greatest because all those other artists you mentioned, yeah, the greatest made them. And see, this artist, he's a beast a lion, the name above names. You don't even realize it, but you encounter his art every day. And he deserves all of the acclaim, he deserves all of the fame, because all other artists pass away, but he remains. Oh, by the way, his name is God. Yahweh, creator, your maker. He's infinitely creative, sir. There is no one greater. And, and I can tell it looks like you're starting to get mad at me. But don't be jealous just because your favorite artist might bend words and my favorite artist bends galaxies. See, in the palm of his hand, he holds all the sand. The author of life when he whispered, let us make man. See, what if I told you that you are God's poetry? You were created because someone else was creative. See, long ago he picked up his eternal paintbrush, dipped it in his glory, placed us in his story, and said, they will live for me. And I know it sounds outlandish, but we're not the product of random chances. And in fact, we're not even the vine. We're actually the branches in the same way we're not the artist. We're actually the canvas. Because in an instant, God started to make art shape you uniquely and beautiful individual from the start. And he touched the canvas of flesh and said, this one is better than the rest. I'll give them so much of my image. So even when they're hot off the press, you can still see the steam of my breath. And so he crafted and he made every arm and leg, ligaments, tendons, muscles, blood vessels, veins, arteries. He said, they're going to have a part of me. And about that time, the guy butted back in and said, that sounds good and all, but I'm wretched and filthy. God won't use me, will he? And I said, ah, see, that's what's awesome about God. No matter what we've done, he can still use us. Even though other artists, once they have broken equipment, they start to make excuses. God instead doesn't refuse us and neither does he accuse us. He redeems us in Jesus, promises never to lose us. So stop saying that you're dirt. Stop saying you're scum of the earth. You ought to be careful about how you talk about someone else's work. Because if we've trusted in Jesus, we can stop saying we're filthy. I mean, all that is anyways is just pride clothed in false humility. I mean, if we only believed that we're truthfully created in his likeness, then we'd stop saying we're wretched, filthy, shameful, guilty, but instead knowing if we've trusted Jesus, we're righteous. I mean, don't you see we're drawn to repentance because of his kindness? So how dare you call yourself worthless when he says you're priceless? But see, the best part is since God is ultimately for God, he'll get glory out of you, whether you like it or not, because even temple ruins point to an architect, even if the temple is shot. And all I'm saying is that he's behind it all. So why do we insist on giving him no credit at all? I mean, he's the one that gave Van Gogh the imagination that changed the face of painting. Tell me, who else is responsible for Mozart being able to compose at age five without formal training? See, he made the fingers that Beethoven used to make art on the keys. For Pete's sake, he made Stevie Wonder, one of the best musicians of our time, and he couldn't even see. And that's why in the same way that our lives are borrowed time, this poem is borrowed lines, because the most ridiculous statement we could ever say is that this poem is mine because we're not self-sustaining. No, we're not self-creating. Technically, nothing we do is original. We're just imitating and that's not a diss all i'm trying to say is this even our own creativity is nothing more than an outflow of his and so i'll end with this you know that quote about giving credit where credit is due well if that's true it's about time we give god his rightful credit too because he's a god in the business of making old things new and here's the truth he's not through with making a masterpiece of you
first song we're going to sing is Come On and Bless the Lord with Me. Come on and clap your hands 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 with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How are you? Yeah, still a little tired, but I'll be all right. I lift your name on high. I'm sorry. I couldn't remember the... <laughs> Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dad you pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praise. And for our opening song, Break Every Chain. There's power. First words are there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of 
Try that again. There's power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Do I have a remote? We're going to have to get an extension for that. Break every chain. An RGB extension so we can bring it there and we can send my laptop there. Because I can't operate without a laptop. That's going to mess my groove up. We'll fix it. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and split up into group prayer. Um, you'll see on some of the pews, uh, if you have a sign next to you, if you could please raise it. There should be one over here in between. So if you'll see, we have six groups that we want to break up into. There's family, strength. Finance, education, health, and church. So if we could go ahead and get into that group that you, that maybe it's weighing on your heart that you really uh, need to pray about this week. Maybe something, um, maybe finances is something that you really would like to pray about, whether it's for you or for someone else. And whoever has, please be your group leader for prayer. So if we can go ahead and break into 
groups. Let's go. Everybody up. Find a group. So we have church over here. We have finance right here. Um, back there, Brother Yancey's education. Which over here with um, Sister Harrison's got family. That's the one that runs. The we have strength right over with Debbie. What and Sister Yancey has help. So if you guys get close to your group, so we can uh, hear. I guess I'm the leader. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Okay. I'm wondering. I have my USB. All right. We'll go ahead and take about a. Is there three or four minutes? We'll do we group prayer, please. In. Thank you. Up here where it would reach it. Because I got a really, really powerful USB remote. It's not going to work. No, we would run, we're running from here. We're running the PowerPoint here, and we're trying to get the remote to run the PowerPoint on, on, on the computer. So where, where does the other... Where does the other thing plug into? Let me go get my, let me go get my, my remote. plugged in is it a cord or that's it right there isn't it that black that no no the black thing under there that's a that's an infrared sensor isn't it the black thing the black thing under the screen this one I think is okay let's try Whichever way is gonna, we'll, we'll do the PowerPoint. And then just go to. Make it live up on the screen, and I'm gonna walk in there and I'm gonna see if it'll work. Just leave it on the first slide. There you go. streaming? Yes. They are? That's going to work. Thank you, Daniel. Um, my, mom, my mom said she's not getting any video on the stream. <laughs> From last time. Do this. You got something you have, bro. That's all right. not here. My mom called 
with my wife and says she's not getting anything. She's on her laptop at home in North Carolina. Tell, tell her to uh, turn off, uh, shut the window off and try to open it. Text her and ask her to close the window on her laptop. Tell her to close Safari and open it back up and try again. Amen. We have the awesome privilege of having Pastor Dean back with us. It seems like just yesterday um, we were gearing up to have him come out the first time, and now we're in 2014. I've been asked to introduce Pastor Dean, and I do have to say this, is that I knew him before he knew me. I used to, I was kind of like a YouTube stalker. <laughs> following his sermons like wow. my mother my mother kind of turned me on to him she was like you got to check out this guy he's really good and I'd be watching his sermons Leslie would call me on the phone this is when we were still dating I'd be like I'm busy I'm watching my pastor's sermons right now um, and I've been richly blessed one sermon I remember in particular is when you were walking on broken glass Wow. yeah that was a while back but I still remember it and it did touch me and so I'm very excited and ecstatic to introduce not only my pastor, but my friend, Pastor Vincent Deem. Amen. All right, I should be good. All right. How's everybody doing? Everybody's good? Amen. Wow, last time I was in this church, I kind of beat y'all up pretty good, didn't I? I did, and your pastor invited me back. Wow. You remember, I, I told you before I started, uh, before I started uh, last time I told you that I got this card in the back of my Bible, and uh, remember the, the, one of the questions, uh, see, I'm kind of nervous. I'm like, y'all have had time to get a sniper team together for, for me this time. Um, I remember um, the two questions that I... Uh, Two questions that I read to you my last time here when I spoke for the church. It says, um, am I intimidated by the message or my audience? Am I ready to say what God wants me to, even if it means I won't be invited back? I remember I read that to you, and, and then I got an invitation back. That's funny. That is, that is funny. And for my, for my uh, audiovisual folks, I found the clicker, Daniel. I found the clicker. It was on the rostrum. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go with uh, with my clicker tonight. Um, if uh, if if anything uh, doesn't go perfectly the way that it's supposed to, then um, that's okay uh, because uh, I am flexible. I cannot touch my toes without bending my knees. I, I cannot uh, put both hands behind my back and go back over my head like that. However, um, I've been placed in enough uh, difficult situations to realize that if I don't have the ability to be flexible, 
then, uh, then it's not going to, it's not going to work out in the end. Um, let's go ahead and state the obvious. Uh, I'm the only white guy on the poster. Okay. Um, let's just, let's just go ahead and get it out of the way. Uh, there are some advantages, uh, to being the only white guy on the poster. Uh, number one, you can see me even though the lights are on. That's an advantage. Um, I, I am, uh, I am probably the one out of the four, uh, that, uh, that, that, that can't, that can't preach. Uh, those other three individuals up there, especially Pastor Ray, uh, I love her dearly. I don't know if you realized it, but she's probably one of the smartest women in the world. Okay? She's incredibly intelligent. Somebody told me this week, Now I haven't gotten this from Pastor Ray because she'll never tell you this, but somebody told me that she is just a little bit from getting her PhD in neuroscience. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm not fact-checking, but one of her best friends um, uh, told me that. Um, of course, you, you were here. Uh, she did an incredible job. I, I, heard, um, uh, I heard what she did, and I, I'm just, I'm really, really proud of her. I'm older than her, so I can actually say that I'm proud of her. Uh, on, on my left, on your, on your poster, uh, is, uh, is Pastor uh, uh, Carlton Bird. Uh, of course, you know him from Breath of Life and Atlanta Berea, and now he's at uh, uh, Oakwood uh, University Church. Uh, I call him Buddy. I consider him a friend also. Um, you know, he can preach circles around me. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, Omar Jarvis, uh, who I have never heard a single person say anything negative about. Everything has just been what a powerful, anointed preacher this guy is. And, again, I ask, the same question, why in the world am I here? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I was telling your pastor um, that uh, I just got done with a, a week of prayer at Andrews University. Um, now, um, this was a different week of prayer. This week of prayer was only for the women on campus. Now, let's state the obvious. I'm not a woman. Okay? I do have a incredible width and breadth of experience in women though don't read that the wrong way um, I, I have been married to my wife my wife is here she doesn't like to be embarrassed just kind of wave wave to your husband there you go that's there that's my wife there uh, Tracy we have been married uh, for uh, for not nearly long enough I did that right did you see how I did that that was good right uh, we haven't been married nearly long enough um, 20 it'll be 23 years uh, 23 23 years in, um, in, in May, May the 23rd, 1991, we were married. Um, I, see, I know these things because when something is important to you, you remember those things. You get it? Write that down. <laughs> write, write it down because I'm not going to give you time when I, when I get into the message for you to get this. So you're going to write your notes quick. Um, we have, uh, I've told you before, we have three children. We have a son uh, who is actually a, uh, an officer in the United States Army. Uh, he was on a full paid academic scholarship to the University of Texas, uh, graduated uh, in, uh, in the business honors program, the only individual of color in his graduating class that graduated from the business honors program. Uh, have a, a daughter, uh, Kelly, uh, who is, uh, who is uh, 22. I want to make sure I got that right. Uh, she was 20, she's 22. Uh, she is uh, back in school now and uh, after serving a year in uh, Tanzania as a student missionary at an orphanage in Arusha, Tanzania. She is the first student in the last eight or not, actually nine years that served as a student missionary from Washington Adventist University. It was so important. They had write-ups about her in, in, the, in, in, in uh, newspapers and all this other stuff. It was a really big deal. Incredibly proud of her. And then our, our baby, which, to be perfectly honest, she's just like me, except she's got more hair, and she looks like she's got a couple drops of chocolate added. Um, but she, <laughs> she, um, you know, uh, she is at Andrews University, and she is, just, uh, in, she is in the process of being inducted into, what is it? Buy something, something. It's the it's the 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 National Honor Society for colleges. She has a 3.93 GPA um, as a, as a junior. She has her mom's intelligence and my good looks. Um, Y'all gonna have to wake up. Listen, it's 10 o'clock my time. Okay, y'all not supposed to be sleepy yet. Um, but but we are we're incredibly we're incredibly pr proud of them. And so, anyways, um, the um, uh, the uh, women's dean 
of Lamson Hall, the women's dean of Andrews University, uh, called me and asked me, she said, I want to invite you to come and speak for our Womanhood Week, which is our Women's Week of Prayer. And I said, did you want to talk to my wife? And, and she said, no, I wanted to talk to you. And I said, why? And she said, because I've met both, the, both of your daughters. And she said, evidently, you as their father have told them some things that, that they needed to hear and that have guided them and turned them, helped turn them in to what God has developed them into. And I, it didn't make sense. And so I, I preached on Sunday night. I preached on Super Bowl Sunday night. Seven o'clock, Super Bowl Sunday. Seven o'clock. <laughs> Ten o'clock on Super Bowl Sunday. Spoke twice on Super Bowl Sunday. I stood up in front of the girls and I said, y'all know I must love you. Because I'm missing the Super Bowl. Little did I know there really wasn't a Super Bowl this year. Um, yeah, I mean, it could have been worse, right? But, um, but, but it wasn't until the Tuesday night, which was my third night uh, speaking, that it really clicked why I was there. And I began to share with them some things that I'm going to share with you tonight that, that really, it, to be honest, the entire atmosphere shifted. And, and, and have you ever sat in church and you didn't feel God? Have you ever sat in, not this church, not this church. When you go visit, you know, um, the other, other churches, good thing I don't know the other church's name, so I won't embarrass anybody. But you go to other churches and maybe you don't feel God or maybe there have been times when you've gone to visit uh, you know, a, a, a supposed men's retreat or women's retreat or youth retreat, and, and, and you know that God's supposed to be there, but, but, he, but he's not, right? And, and so what, what, I, what happened on that Tuesday night was, was God showed up and totally took the direction of the, the, re, the remainder of those meetings over. And so that's what, that's what my prayer is for us uh, during, these, um, during these few nights that I'm here and then on, as we finish on Sabbath. Um, my desire is that, that, that you walk away starting tonight. You walk away when you go out of those, those brown doors there and that brown door there and that white door there. Um, you walk out one of those doors and what you say is not, wow, Pastor Dean, he's pretty good. You, I don't want you to. I don't want that to 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 exit your mouth. I, I don't want you to say, "Man, that was he did a really good job." No. I, I I I my prayer for you during this time is that you see God. Okay, because I mean anybody can go to church and get their ticket punched, right? Anybody can come up here and preach. Anybody can come up here and talk. But what if? What if? You left this place tonight, and you had an encounter with God. Whitley Phipps said, I believe it's been about five years ago, he stood up at the Allegheny West Conference camp meeting, and these words came out of his mouth. He said, the Holy Spirit is not present in most of our churches, and we're too stubborn to realize it. Over my dead body, will that happen this week? Amen? Amen. Can I pray for you before we get started? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your presence in this building right now. Lord, no, 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 Father. We know you're already here. Because you said you'd never leave us or forsake us. So, Lord, therefore, you are already here. Lord, we're just asking for more of you. We're, we're asking for anything that is inside of us that would prevent you from moving in this church tonight. We ask it to be removed in the name of Jesus. Lord, if it's our worry, if, our, if it's our problems, if it's our fear, if, our, if it's our hang-ups, if it's our hidden sin, Lord, if it's our stubbornness, if it is our pride, if it is our arrogance that is preventing you from coming in this building, Father God, remove those things right now because we want to see your face. Lord, we ask now as we open up your word and as we study, Lord, we ask that you will speak to the deepest, darkest parts of our hearts. Lord, we're tired of just coming to church to stamp our ticket, treading water till the day that we are called home. Lord, we want to experience you now. Lord, the same way Elijah did, the same way Moses did, Lord, dare I say, the way that Jesus did. Lord, as we open up your word, Lord, I pray that the sins that are in my life, Lord, I pray that there is nothing, nothing that is unforgiven, nothing that is hidden, 
nothing that will prevent you from being in charge tonight. Lord, we ask now your blessings upon us. In the precious name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love my wife. Y'all need to understand that from the giddy up. I love my wife. My wife saved me. She saved me. She literally saved me. She will tell you that it was God, but, but, but God used her, and she was stubborn enough to listen. Um, see, what happened was my wife and I, we, we knew each other. We, we came from the same, this, well, she was born in, in Connecticut. I was born in North Carolina, but she got there as soon as she could. She got to North Carolina as soon as she could. You know, she realized that there was a mistake for the first seven years of her life, and she moved where the winners lived, okay? Uh, that's, that's where we are. Now, I know that y'all got a little school down the, down the street. Y'all won a couple national championships. I believe y'all had a coach that used to chew on a towel. Yeah. I also remember he had NCAA violations that nearly cost you your national championships. I remember that. I remember when it was Larry, uh, Larry Johnson and Stacy Augman and Anthony Hunt and Greg Anthony. See, if I didn't watch it, I wouldn't remember that, right? I remember the year that they beat the doors off of Duke in the national championship. I remember that because it happened on my birthday. It was 1990. 1990, April the 2nd, 1990. I remember where I was at watching that ball game. Go on and Google it and see if I ain't right. So anyways, we fell in love uh, a little later than when we were little children. We got together and fell in love. And, and, and I've been working to maintain her love for me ever since then. So what I do to do that is every once in a while I'll go and I'll get her some flowers and I'll put them in a vase on the kitchen table and she'll come in and she was like, oh, thank you for the flowers. Now understand that when we first got together, that woman there didn't like flowers. <laughs> she looked at them as if they were a waste of time, effort, and money. However, as she has gotten older and as she has gotten better, she has realized that flowers are a way that a man easily can express the way he loves her. Okay, there are times that, that I've given my daughter's advice on men, and those of you that are not married, listen to this, and those of you who are married, put this into practice today. Never, ever, ever listen to what a man says. Never, ever, ever listen to what a man says. Watch what he does. Okay? So what I'll do is I'll do things... That, that a lot of men don't. I get up in the morning and I make the bed. Sometimes when she's still in it. <laughs> it's time to get up. Let's get up. <laughs> when she comes home from work and if her car is low on gas and it needs gas, I take it to the gas station at night. Maryland left six inches of snow on the ground when we came. Take a car to the gas station. When she tells me it's low on gas, you know, because I'm not going out there to check and it'd be full. <laughs> I'll take it when it's time to, <laughs> she's laughing because she knows it's true. Um, I'll take it to the, uh, take it to the, uh, uh, to get it serviced, to get the oil changed when the light comes on and it's time. I'll do those things, but one of the things that I really, really enjoy doing is I love going in the store and getting her a card. And you know you search for just the right card, and Daniel, you can go ahead and turn my slides on for me. Um, I, you got to get just the right card. And so this is the latest card that I got her. And you will notice that it's addressed to her. It says T. Because there ain't but one T that's important to me. You get that? So she knows who it's addressed to. And I'm telling you, I put the T on it and she knows who it's from. And this is what it is. It's two, two ice cream cones. And they're kissing. And it's got a little heart above them. And the card says, you Make me melt. And then I put here, I love you, and then I sign it, V. Because there ain't but one V in her life. <laughs> so I give, her, I give her this card, and, you know, many cards like it. And, 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 and by what, the things that I do, my wife knows, knows that I love her. But tonight, I'm going to share with you something that if you are a man or if you are a woman, I'm going to share with you something tonight if I can get my remote working. Let's do right here. I'm going to get right here. Nope. One more time. All right, Daniel, I'm going to need you to go. I'm going to need you to be my automatic clicker. Give me two clicks. 
Bam. One more. Bam. There it is. How to tell if someone loves you. Um, what uh, what I, I did is, uh, well, well, first of all, let me, let me show you a couple definitions. Give me another one. Matter of fact, can I just, can I snap and you do it? Because it really throws me off. Love is an, it can be uh, referred to as a noun. It's a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal desires. That's love as a noun. Love as a verb, hit it. It means to cherish. Love as a verb means to thrive in. Love as a verb means to desire actively. See, love can either be a noun or a verb. And so when I, was, when I was praying about this and putting this together, I began to think about how, how can I find out whether somebody loves me or not? Okay? Now, let's just, let's, just be, let's just be honest. Not everybody that says that they love you loves you. I was in seventh grade. The girl's name was Wendy Malden was her name. Everybody say Wendy. Wendy. Not like the Wendy. Because that's the way I should have said her name. Wendy was her name. And she told me four days before Valentine's Day that she loved me. I ain't no no different. She told me she loved me. So when it came time for me to get her Valentine's presents, because she was smart enough four days before Valentine's Day to tell me that she loved me, I got her a teddy bear some chocolates, and I, I don't remember, but maybe a flower or two. And I gave it to her first thing the morning of Valentine's Day at school, seventh grade. She took those things from me, and she said, don't tell anybody you did it. I got played because I did not know the signs, symptoms, and descriptions of what it looks like when somebody really loves you. So I went where we all go for our answers. No, not the Bible. I went to the internet. And I found a 13-year-old girl that had a website, and I haven't been able to find the website. I think her parents made her put it down, take it down. But on this website, this young lady tells how you can make sure if a boy loves you or not. Give me, give me one, Daniel. This is just one of the graphics from her. The little picture there is one of her graphics that was on her website. And here's some things that she brings up on how to tell if somebody loves you. Does he love me is what she entitled it. The first thing she says is, does he talk about your future together like it's a given? Now understand that these are periods at the end of the sentences. They should be question marks and that's going to drive me bonkers for the rest of the night. Does he talk about your future together like it's a given? Does he give you meaningful compliments? Does he say I love you and mean it? The next, uh, I think there's two on this page. It says, does he really open up to you? The next one says, does he tell you how much he misses you when you're apart? Next slide, uh, does he love me? There's three bullets on this one. She says, does he listen to anything slash everything that you say? Nobody does that. <laughs> Is he always there for you? And then finally, going back to love is a verb. Love means, oh, to cherish, <laughs> to thrive in. Oh, this is so fun. <laughs> to desire actively. This little girl, 13, 14-year-old little girl, asked these questions. And if you go back and if you look at the questions, those are some pretty good questions, right? Those are some pretty good questions. Does he listen to absolutely anything and everything that you say? Does he miss you when you're not around? I mean, these are great, great questions. So tonight, I'm just going to take you through some scripture, and I'm going to show you how you can be sure that God loves you using a 13 or 14 year old girl's ruler, measuring device, or quantitative whatever you want to put there and make yourself smell smart. Anyways, next, 
Next slide. Here we go. John 13, 33. Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you can't. Where you are going, <laughs> where I am going, you cannot come. This is so much fun. Uh, next verse. A new commandment I give to you, a what? A new commandment. A new commandment I give you. Remember, uh, remember I think I told you uh, when I was here last time that uh, you remember there's ten commandments, right? Remember there's ten commandments? Yeah. What's the first commandment? I should love the Lord your God with all your heart, okay? And then what's the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? Remember that? Remember that one? Yeah, we, we, we make sure we, we follow those ten, right? But when you get to this one, because it's in New Testament, it's not in Exodus chapter 20. We don't think it's as valid. But Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. Now we know this verse by heart. We've practiced this verse. We've, we've done our best to, to, to follow this verse exactly the way it's written. And the next verse in verse uh, 35 says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Notice that Jesus did not say if you have memorized most of the little red books, people will know that you are my disciples. Notice that Jesus did not say if you do not eat pork, people will know that you are my disciples. Notice he did not say that if you wear sleeves and long pants and nobody other than yourself sees your ankles, they will know that you are my disciples. He says if you have love for other people, you will be known as a disciple of Jesus. But let's go back to verse 34. Give me the next slide, please. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Next slide. Even as I have loved you. You want to talk about setting the bar high. You want to talk about putting the bar almost too far to reach. You want to talk about the Flawsbury flop. Remember the individual that transferred the, the way that the high jump used to be done. Remember the high jump? They used to jump over it like this, uh, belly first. Or some of them uh, even would just jump and throw their legs up like a kind of weird kind of hurdle type thing. But uh, the individual that came up with the Flawsbury flop, I do not remember his first name. We'll call him Mr. Mr. Flawsbury. He's the one that developed the, the high jump. Uh, to come up, jump off of one foot, and go backwards over the bar, bending your back over it. Not even Mr. Flawsbury could get over Jesus' standard of love, but that's the bar that's been set for us. We, as Christians, are supposed to love people, regardless of whether they, uh, they're ugly or pretty, regardless of whether they are light or dark regardless of whether they're in a conference or a your conference or a different conference, regardless of whether they go to your church or somebody else's church, regardless of whether they work on one day when, they're, when you're in church and they're in church when you're at work. It does not matter whether they bow down to a different God. Jesus says, love one another as he has loved us. So this verse tells us a lot of things. It tells us that there's a new commandment. It tells us that, that, we're, that people are going to recognize us as his disciples because of the love that we have for them. We, we get all those things, but the one point that I wanted to bring out is that even as I have loved you, the way that Jesus loved people is the way that we are supposed to be loving people. John, 1 John 4 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Some of the most unloving people I have pastored in the past. Some of the deepest, most vicious wounds on my heart have been, de been uh, delivered by Christian folk. Board members. Elders. Other pastors. 
Anyone who does not love, anyone who does not demonstrate the love of Jesus does not know God. Why? Because God is love. Next slide. God is love. So it's not just knowing about God. Oh, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. What's our president's name? Barack Obama. He's from Hawaii, right? Barack Hussein Obama. Let me ask you a question. How, how old are you? You wanted me to call on you tonight, didn't you? Yeah, you wanted to be the center of attention. Come on, I'm getting ready to quiz you, chick. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be careful next time you tell me to call on you. Sit down right there. What's the president's wife's name? Michelle Obama. Wow. One right. How many, how many kids does he have? Two. Two. Sons, daughters, or a mixture? Daughters. Two daughters. What are their names? Oh. There you go. Yeah. Huh? Malia? Malia? Yeah. Sasha. Sasha and Malia. Y'all can't tell her the answer now. <laughs> Sasha and Malia. Um, do they have a pet? Yes. What, what kind of pet is it? A dog. Now I'm going to let you ask because you have no clue what the dog's name is. What's the dog's name? Oh. Hmm? Oh, they got two dogs now? Are you telling a lie or are you just, you, you know they got two dogs now? One is Bo and one is Luke? Nobody got that. Nobody got, you got that? You got that? Good, good, all right. At least one other person got Bo and Luke. They were Duke, that Dukes of Hazard. Daisy Dukes, their brother, right? All right, you got it now? Okay. Oh, wait a minute, Jessica Simpson? You know Jessica Simpson? She was, anyway, okay, Bo and Luke. Anyway, so they got, they got two dogs now, according to her, Bo, and what's the other dog's name? The other dog? Was it? Rudolph? Okay, anyway, so we don't know. Okay, where was, where was, uh, where was President Obama born? Hawaii. Hawaii, very good. Um, do you know where he went to college? No. Where did he go to college? Harvard. Harvard, right? After he graduated Harvard, let's say after he graduated law school, where did he move and start working in public service? Chicago. Chicago. See, I'm asking you these questions you're supposed to know. So you don't ask to be included in a demonstration if you don't have the answers. You're 14, right? Yes. Yeah, I figured, because 14, you think you know everything. So let me ask you one more question, really, really easy question. Um, how long has he been president? Six. <laughs> That's your final answer? Six years. Okay, good. Good. So you know a lot about the Obama family, right? I mean, you're know, not really, but I'm just, I'm giving, they, they, right? What if I took you to the White House? Okay? And what if we could get back, we could get past security, right? Mm -hmm. And what if I could get you in the Oval Office, right? He's got a couch, right? He's got his desk, he's got a couple couches in there. And if I sit you down on the couch and I leave you there, I just leave you in the Oval Office, nobody's in there but you. And then Barack, President Barack Hussein Obama, comes in his office. He's going to run up to you and say, hey, how are you? I've missed you so much. Oh, my goodness. Because you know him, right? No. You don't know him. I know about him. Oh, you know about him. But you don't know him personally. No. Huh. Y'all didn't get that. <laughs> See, a lot of times we know all the facts about God. But we don't know him personally. Right. You see what I'm saying? See, you know a lot about our president. But you don't know him. Know him. You embarrassed now? No. Well, get on back and sit down. I'll get you, <laughs> I'll get you tomorrow night. See, 
we know all the facts about God. We know how the world was created and, you know, six days and on seventh he rested. And we know the, about God's judgment and we know about the fire and the brimstone. We know all this other stuff. But the one thing that we really, really need to know, which is God, Amen. there's a disconnect. There's an absolute disconnect that prevents us from reaching our potentials as his total and absolute children. See, because we look at him as this man in heaven with a hammer playing whack-a-mole when we mess up. Oh! Boom. Boom. God is love. Let me make sure I'm... So let's look at what this young lady, these questions. Give me the first one. Does he talk about your future together? Like it's a given. Next slide. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Next slide, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Does he talk about our future with him? 13-year-old girl says you can tell somebody loves you if he talks about your future together. Next slide. She also says, does he give you meaningful compliments? Hmm. Next slide. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Wow, we're, we're his children. John 15, 15 says, next slide, Daniel. 15, 15 says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You are no longer considered his servant, but you are his friend. There is no greater gift that a man can do than lay down his life for his friend, for his brother. Jesus talks about our future with him over and over. Matter of fact, we got one more. Romans 8, verse 17 says, And if children then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So no longer are we friends, but we're co-children, co-heirs with Jesus. Marinate in that. Think, think, think about your picture of who God is. Think about your, 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 your view of how he looks at you when you mess up. Had a very humbling experience happen two Mondays ago. My son, as I told you, was, is uh, an officer in the United States Army. He lives in El Paso, Texas now. And um, very responsible young man, just like his mother. Not forgetful at all, like his father. Um, when he was going in the Army, he decided that he was going to give my oldest daughter, Kelly, his car. Just take the car. Loving, caring, and compassionate like his mother. So he gives, her the, he gives my daughter this car, right? And she's been driving it, loving it, driving the wheels off of it. Literally driving the wheels. It needs tires, right? Literally just tearing a car up. So um, Monday night, my wife and I, there are two television shows that we watch. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I will tell you it comes on at 8 and 8.30 on CBS. I'm not going to tell you what they are, though. Um, one of them ha only has a few weeks left. Uh, but anyways, we're watching our two television shows, and um, um, the phone rings, and it's my phone that rings. It's not, it's not uh, her phone. It's my phone, and I pick it up, and I was like, what's up, Kel? She said, Daddy. She only calls me Daddy when something's wrong. She'll call me Dad. She'll call me Pops. 
She'll call me father. You know, she'll just call me anything but parental, right? Male parental. She, she'll do that when she's mad at me. Um, she called me daddy. So I knew so. Was, what, what's up? She said, um, I was just in an accident. It's like, whoa. Just in an accident. Kelly, are you okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. She said, I was at a stoplight. There was a car in front of me. She said, light turned green. The guy didn't move. She said, I bumped into him. She said, didn't do any damage to his car whatsoever. Didn't scratch it or anything. She said, but the problem is, I can't find the insurance card. It's like, whoa, okay. So she can't find the insurance card. And she said, the man's angry. She said, he's being a hind part. I'll let you fill in those, those words. She didn't, you know, derriere, he's being a, you understand, he's not being nice. He said he's going to call the cops. What do I do? I said, just relax, baby. It'll be all right. So the cop gets there. The cop is very, very nice. However, because Kelly cannot find the insurance card, he says she does not have, she does not have um, uh, 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 verification, insurance verification. And because she doesn't have insurance verification, he says, I can't let you drive the car. So my 22-year-old daughter is put out of the car. It's cold outside. She has to call a friend to come pick her up, and they tow her brother's car to impound. Okay? So she tells me that in, in this particular county that you cannot pick the car up until you receive a letter in the mail. You, you understand. Those of you that have experience in law enforcement, you understand that's a rook, right? That's, that's, that's an arrangement somewhere, and I'm saying this on the internet, and I hope you hear me, Prince George County, Maryland. <laughs> this is a rook and a racket because they want your car to stay there as long as possible, right? So what I decide to do is I'll, I'll wait a couple days, and, and you know, I got I to I gotta make sure that, 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 that she's available, I'm available. I had some other stuff that had to go on. So anyways, on Friday, which is usually my sermon preparation day. It's usually I spend all, uh, most of the day on Thursday and a good portion of the day on Friday putting my stuff together for Sabbath. And so um, I, I, I wait till Friday, and I say, okay, Kel, this is what's going to happen. I said, I'm going to take you to school because she had stayed with us the night before. I said, I'm going uh, to take you to school. I said, then I'm going to go from there. I'm going to make sure I'm going to uh, make sure that the insurance situation, because he had insurance in Wisconsin where he was working before he went in the army, and so I said, you know, I'm going to take care of it. I said, don't worry. So I go and I take care of the insurance information. I go to the police department. The police department doesn't know where the car is. They say, oh, you know, we only use two towing companies. So I get on the phone. I call both of them. Nope, we don't have the car. So I go back inside, and I, I realize there's six or seven people in front of me. So I'm like, I got to get on the, you know, I gotta, I'm going to go online and see what I can find. So anyways, I go online. I find out where the car is. I call the woman. I said, do you have this car? She said, yes. I said, okay. She said, well, don't you want to know how much it is? No should have been my answer. But yes was my answer. She said, oh, it's only $375. Wow. Yeah, that's not cool at all. I'm a pastor. We don't make no money. I don't, I, don't, I don't live in Vegas. I can't go to the roulette table and just pull, you know. I, I wouldn't do that. That's a joke. That's a joke. Not that your pastor does. Your pastor does not do that. I'm just, that was a joke. That was a joke. So after I left the police department, the police station, as I'm, as I'm I've got this information in my head. It's going to be $375. I've already been running around for three hours trying to take care of this stuff for her. And I go to pick her up, right? I go back to the school to pick her up because we got to go get, back, go get the car because even though I'm awesome, I do not have the ability to drive two cars at the same time. I'm working on it. I'm going to figure it out one day, but don't have that ability yet. So I go to get her. And the whole way to get her and the whole way to where the service station was supposedly where the car was, inside of me, I'm trying to be mad. Because $375, I mean, that's not just a little bit of money. I mean, for some of y'all, I mean, that's, you know, you could, <clears throat> oh, there's $375. Not me. I got two daughters in college. It's not easy. I wanted to be mad. But I held it. And I'm just, you know, I understand this is my daughter. 
She looks at me. She's going to marry a man like me. Right? She looks at me for what the model is of what she's going to end up like, so i gotta, I got to hold it together, right? Kelly, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. So we get to the service station, $375. Where's the car? Oh, it's at our impound lot. It's four miles away. Understand that it's 2.30 on a Friday afternoon in Prince George County, Maryland, which is just, you want to talk about busy. That's busy, busy takes us half an hour to go four miles. We get there, the gate's locked. We got to wait for the guy to come unlock the gate. 35, 45 minutes. By the time I get home, it's like 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I left at 8 o'clock, and I've been running all day. I had to come home, take off my shoes, take off my shirt, and lay on the bed and take a nap because my brain was hurting. When we left the impound yard with her car, I noticed the, that her, um, oh, oh, I mi missed this part. Her battery was dead. So we had to jump the car off, right? Once we jumped it off, we were, everything was good. Uh, we, get, we were heading out, and I noticed her tire's a little flat or a little low. Kelly, let's go put some air in the tire. So we go to the thing. Uh, all I've got is 75 cents. She has no change. So she said, Dad, I got, I got a dollar because it's a dollar to do the air. She said, Dad, I got a dollar. She goes inside to get quarters. They said, no, we don't do that. But if you just pull around to the bay, service station, right, pull around to the bay, then we'll put some air in it for you. Well, that's a racket because he wanted to replace the tire. <laughs> He's spraying soap on the tire to see where it bought. I said, just put air in it. <laughs> Ain't no hole that's been sitting for three days in the snow. Just put air in the tire. And I wanted to get angry, right? And so driving home, these feelings were still. That girl done cost me $375. She cost me a whole day of sermon prep. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I'm upset. And God leaned over heaven. How many times did your parents bail your hind part out and they never said nothing don't ever God speaking to me because I was there don't ever forget where you came from see but what we do is we forget where God delivered us from we also forget where we came from, came from. We'll get to that in a minute. We are his children. Next slide for me. Does he say, I love you and mean it? And of course, you know what verse is coming up now. Give me the next verse. John 3, 16, for God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Next slide. We're going to move through these next few quickly. Does he really open up to you. Remember, uh, give me next slide. Remember in Luke chapter 7, Jesus goes up uh, this trail, up this little road to, to this town called Nain, right? It's, it's N-A-I-N. And as he, he is headed up the, the road, there's a woman leading a processional down. And, and we learn as reading the story that her son it, has died. It says a widow has lost her son. Understand that men were the sole financial providers of families back then. So this woman already has lost her husband. The Bible says this is her only son. She has no means of financial support from this moment on. Her son is being carried in a basket that is, in essence, a, 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 a casket with a piece of linen draped over it. And the Bible says, go back one, go back one for me. The Bible says, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and he said, said, do not weep. Now give me the next one. When, he, when the Bible says that Jesus had compassion, the Greek word is splakisonomai. Splakisonomai is the word that is translated, he had compassion. You learned something tonight. You didn't think you'd learn anything from me. You thought you were going to learn, you thought you learned something last week with Pastor Ray. You're definitely going to learn something next week with Pastor Bird. But you didn't think you was going to learn anything from me. The Greek word is splakisonomai. And you're like, okay, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is that splakisonomai actually comes from a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word is splunkna. 
you learn two things. <laughs> Splakisinomai is the Greek word. Splunkna is the Hebrew word. This translation where it says he had compassion, in Hebrew, when it says splunkna, splunkna means your entrails. It means your guts. It means your bowels. It means as deep inside of him as you could possibly get. Oh, that makes sense now. Oh, that preach. We won't let Pastor Bird preach that next week. But they, I'm going to let you marinate with that because, because when the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on somebody, with somebody, it meant as deep as you could possibly go inside of him from the depths of him. That's how he feels towards us. His passion, his love for us is so deep, we can't even begin to get that far. Does that make sense? One more. Well, maybe a couple more. Does he tell you how much he misses you when you're apart? Next verse. So he told them this parable. You know this story. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Next verse. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Next verse. Just so I tell you, there will be more, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need. No repentance. You want to talk about how much he misses us when we're gone. He comes for us when we're lost. Next, next one says, does he listen to anything and everything that you say? In Isaiah 58, listen to this. Just watch these next two. These next two, this is the meat and potatoes. In, in Isaiah 58, verse 9, the very first part of it says, then you shall call you. Folks that are here tonight will call, and the Lord will answer. The other night I was in the bedroom. My wife was watching something on television in the living room that I had already seen. I have no desire sitting through the same thing twice. And she called me. Vince, what? Vince, yes. Vince, okay, I'm coming. What if God was like that? The Bible says you call. He will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Let me show you something. The first time I read it blew my mind. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. Now, those of you that love Revelation, you love prophecy and stuff like this, this is going to blow, blow you the top of your head off. It says, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Next one. Look at this. Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Which saints? Every saint that's ever lived. Your prayers are so important to God that he saves them for eternity. Look at this. I'm not making that up. What saints? That's you. That's me on Tuesdays and Thursdays. He saves my prayers. And, and he keeps them because he wants, you don't keep something from somebody you don't love. Amen. You don't keep something from somebody that don't love you. When my wife and I got married, I, I, we got married, I moved out of my mom's house. My mom came to me about three months later. She's laughing, Tracy's laughing. My mom, I love her. Mom, I hope you're watching. I hope you're watching right now because I love you. My mom asked me, we had been married like three months. I came back to my mom's house. She said, listen, I found this box. I wanted to know, do you want it? It had old girlfriend pictures, <laughs> old girlfriend letters in it. It had all kinds, like little gifts and trinkets, little ex-girlfriends had given me and stuff. I said, yeah, mom, give me that box. I got a key. No, man. I didn't want, I don't want that. You don't 
don't keep nothing from somebody you don't love. You don't keep something from somebody that doesn't love you. You are so important to God that he has kept every prayer you have ever prayed. Even the ones you didn't mean. Even the ones you didn't even pray, but you knew you wanted. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. You understand the word desire, right? It, it's a compound word. Well, not really a compound word, but it's got a prefix, right? And it's got a root. The prefix is D-E. D-E means of. If you haven't taken the SAT yet, I'm helping you. You're going to pass because of me. D-E means of. Sire, S-I-R-E, means father. The things that you have in your life, the desire, the desire to make more money so you can provide for your family, so you can help the church's ministry, not so you can just be rich and flaunt it. The desire to live in a nice house so that people can come over and so maybe you have enough room so that somebody could come and stay with you, you know. Those desires, those desires come from God. The desire that you can have a nice car and, 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 and be able to get back and forth to, to help people and to do things. Those desires come from, those things are from God. Okay, all right, I got I to gotta speed up. I'm way over time. Next one. Is he always, <laughs> is he always there for you? Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6. Hit it, there we go. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. And he will not leave you or forsake you. One of the most profound things I have ever heard in my entire life was from, from a preacher that in this particular sermon that I heard, he was speaking at a convention, the convention center here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And what he said was that when you ask, you, we are in the habit of asking God for things that he has already provided. And those are prayers that are impossible for him to answer. You heard me in my opening prayer. I alluded to that fact. I almost said, God, be here with us. But he already is. So why would I pray for him to be here if he's already here? Okay. We're on, the, we're on the ending portions now. Just real quick. These are just some things real quick. Next slide. God created us. Think about that for a minute. God created us. Think about what it looked like when God created Adam, think about the fact that he spoke the sun into existence. Boom, let there be sun, and there was. He spoke the, the, the water, let there be water, and it was. He said, let there be a giraffe. Boom, there was a giraffe. He didn't take his time. He just spoke, and things were created. But when he created Adam, the Bible says that he formed Adam out of the dirt of the ground. Now, I have spent more than enough time playing in the dirt as a young man and even as an older man uh, and I noticed that when you play in the dirt dirt gets under your fingernails dirt gets in the crevices of your fingers dirt gets everywhere you don't want it to playing in the dirt is a personal experience he created Adam out of the dust of the ground now he could have stood up from there and could have said stand up and breathe Adam but the Bible says now watch this this is really really awesome he, he, the Bible says that he pray, placed the breath of life where? In his nostrils. You're going to be embarrassed two times. Come here. Quick, quick, quick. Come on, I ain't got all the time. They're going to talk about it. I'm long-winded. And I saw Pastor Ray preach on Sabbath for a full hour. Lay down here. On the floor? No, no, lay down on the steps. Yeah, duh. Thank you. Okay, I used to teach pre-hospital pre trauma life support, advanced trauma life support, Advanced cardio life support. I used to teach all of these classes. And what I, another thing I used to teach was CPR. And what I know, that the way that I used to teach CPR, is that if you find somebody and you say, hey, are you okay? Hey, go get help, all that good stuff. And I check to see if you're breathing. One of the things that I would do, I'd put one hand, well, I'm going to hit you, it's no problem. I'd put, I'd put my hand behind your neck, I'd put one hand on your forehead, and I'd open up your airway. Right? And then I would pinch her nose, and I would breathe into her mouth. Right? You can get up now. Now, what if she was a baby? If she was a baby, you know what you do? You hold her in your arm, you hold her head down, and you breathe into her 
nostrils. Nobody got that. You are God's baby. He created you. You can go sit down. Hey, guess what? You're God's baby too. He created you. Check it out. Check it out. He created you, and it was a personal, intimate experience. And so when you stand in front of the mirror, and I know guys do this too, but we, you know, women, they usually do this. You get in front of the mirror, it's like, I don't like this. This stuff right here, right? Or if you're like me, you got a scar on your face, and you're just like, man, you realize that you're criticizing God's handiwork? Because God is perfect. One of the, the, the greatest sermon I've ever heard in my entire life, the greatest sermon I've ever heard in my entire life made this point. We grow up thinking that taking the Lord's name in vain, which is one of the commandments, right? Right? We thought it was saying Jesus Christ or other bad ways that you can say the name of God, right? Moses, this is the point of this other person's sermon. I'm not going to tell you who it is. This other person's sermon, he says, he used to think that was taking the Lord's name in vain. And then he went to the book of Exodus where God called Moses at the burning bush. And Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And he said, tell them I am sent you. He's like, what? Tell them I am sent you. You stand in front of the mirror. You come out to shower. There's nobody else in your bedroom. You stand in front of the mirror. I am fat. I am ugly. I am stupid. God created you. He created you. You don't create something you hate. Next slide. He created the world for us. For us. I know, I know some of you starched believers. Y'all think that the earth was created for the enemy and the enemy has dominion over this. Excuse me, didn't Jesus say that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to him? And because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we inherit that authority, correct? Amen. Ask you a question. If all authority on heaven and earth has been given to us, and remember, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, it says that humans were designed to reign over every living thing. Is the devil alive or dead? He's alive, right? We were created to have dominion over the enemy. Jesus says all power on heaven and earth has been given to him. So the only power the enemy has is what we give him. He created this world for us. And we're waiting for heaven for things to work out on our behalf. We sit here and think because we're because we go to church on Saturday, that we're going to be ostracized and pushed. I know that's part of prophecy. But I also know that when Jesus prayed what is known as the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You look at that in your Bible, there's a comma. After thy will be done, comma, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' desire is for earth to be like heaven. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I know the difference between a comma and a period. I also know that there were no punctuation marks in Greek. But I do have a minor in biblical languages if you want to debate that later. He created this world for us so that we can walk around and his glory be demonstrated in our lives. But we give the devil too much credit. We go and pray for somebody that's got cancer. We pray for them and say, Lord, if it's not your will. But wait a minute. His will is for heaven to be like earth. Greater things. We do, I did that. I did that when I was here in November, right? Greater things we should be able to do because we have the presence of God inside of us. Amen. Yet we walk around thinking that sin city has got more power than our God does. He created the world for us. Next slide. I'm finishing. Finishing right now. 
He chose us. I don't have to expound on that other than Ephesians chapter 1. Give it to me. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose you before he created you. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Next, next slide. You know these next two. He died for you. And lastly, he takes care of us. I want to, I want to, I'm kind of new school. I know, you know, the old school preachers, they come, on, come to church on Wednesday night and they preach and they may say a prayer here and a prayer there. But I want to I do something that I don't know whether you've ever done before. I'm going to, I'm going to, I've, I've asked them to bring me a stool. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on this stool and I'm going to sit there, and if your desire is to have me pray for you, then I'm going to ask you just to come down, and I will stay as late as I need to. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you because, because I believe right now, this is what I believe God's leading me to tell you. Is there some people in here that somebody has told you that you were ugly? Somebody in here has probably been, even been told it. God don't love you. God don't like you. God is ashamed of you. And tonight, maybe something that was said, or I hope it was a verse or something, popped in your head and you realize that God truly does love you. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm not asking you to be baptized. That will come later in the week. But, but what I want to do tonight, I just, I just want to pray for you. Maybe you got an issue going on in your life, but I don't want you to come to me and say, Pastor Dean, I need you to pray for my son because he's out of the church. Because the Bible says we know not what to pray, but the Holy Spirit impresses us what to pray. So if you want to tell me what you want me to pray for, that's okay, but I'm going to listen to God anyways. I preached in New York uh, months ago, like six months ago. I preached in New York, and I did this prayer thing like I'm doing now. I just God told me, stop your sermon. I stopped halfway through, and I was just like, okay, I, I, God told me to finish. I need to pray. And this, um, this woman came up to me as I, as I was praying for people. This woman came up to me and she t asked me, she said, I need you to pray for my hip. So I was like, I'm not listening to that. And I started praying and as we were praying, I got this impression that her mar marriage was in trouble, her husband had a girlfriend, and I started praying for those things. Lord, I pray you drive a wedge between this woman's husband and his girlfriend. By the time I finished, this is not an exaggeration, my hands were covered with her tears. See, that's what we're here for, right? Yeah. We're here to have an encounter with God. We're here for something supernatural to happen. Don't let that word scare you because all supernatural means is something outside of the normal. God is supernatural. Amen. Amen. I just want to do that. We're going we're gonna to end the broadcast. They don't need to hear. They don't need to just see people coming up here or whatever. And I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to turn my microphone off and I'm going to pray a benediction right now and I'm going to invite you if you want to come up make a line I'll stay here as late as you want I'm driving right my wife's going to be riding we're going to ride back to the hotel she don't have to drive she can sit there and take a nap if she needs to I'll stay here as late as I need to amen, amen. she's mad at me now but that's okay <laughs> that's okay can I pray for you and then, uh, and then uh, if those of you that want me to pray for you then we'll, we'll do that let's pray dear heavenly father we pray that your holy spirit will guide us to make the the best decision tonight, Lord. Those that need special prayer, Lord, I pray that you will lay it on their hearts. Bring them up, uh, up front, Lord. And I pray that, uh, that those others, Lord, will have, have learned something, will have heard something, Lord. And we pray that you will draw closer to us as we go to sleep tonight. Lord, as our head hits the pillow, we pray that we will feel more love than we have ever felt in our entire lives. Lord, we pray that you will whisper in our ears over and over and over again how much you love us, how much you care for us, and how much you adore us. And Lord, not only help us to hear that, but help us to believe it. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit continue to work in us, through us. Be with us until we meet again tomorrow night at 7. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.